Greetings. This is the lecture for John chapter 11, lesson number 15. Let's, let's pray. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, you are the, the great miracle worker. You have the power to accomplish whatever you will. And we pray now as we study your son's raising of um, Lazarus, we pray that the, the truths about your resurrection power, your ability to uh, do marvelous things in the lives of your people. We pray that these truths would come forth, um, be impressed, that, that you would impress them upon our hearts and minds, that we would, um, when we get into times of trials, that we too would, um, would rest in your great promises and your power, and that we would... Um, glorify you through our actions. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, this week we come to the seventh and the final sign that John records in his gospel account. It's the famous story of Lazarus being raised from the dead by Jesus. As we've learned this year, these signs, these physical miracles, always point to greater claims that Jesus makes. <clears throat> Some have referred to Lazarus's raising as a resurrection, but technically, that's not true. Um, I think it would be better to refer to Lazarus, his raising as being a resuscitation. Um, think about it. He, he was raised from the dead, but he ultimately died again. So we, we should think of Lazarus' raising as a type. His raising validates Jesus' claim that he is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus then says, the one who believes in him will live even though he dies. Jesus' own resurrection, though, is different from Lazarus's. Jesus was raised to a glorified and eternal body. Now, both their raisings, Lazarus and Jesus, are historical facts, but, but Jesus' resurrection is uh, the foundation. It's the essential teaching of our Christian faith. The Apostle Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might have supremacy. Jesus' resurrection is a guarantee of our promised resurrection. Jesus' role in our res resurrection is key because it will be his voice that raises us just as he did with Lazarus. Jesus' resurrection power is the power that is available to us today in our lives. It allows us to weather the storms of life and to come out on the other end. Jesus' resurrection then is the backdrop for our lesson. Because we, what we see in this lesson is how God works in our lives. You know, here in Bible Study Fellowship, our vision statement, our vision is to magnify God and mature his people. And that vision statement would apply to my, as my aim for this lesson. Um, uh, th that is that we would come to understand God's motivation even in the darkest motives, motive, moments of our lives. Because as we live in the promise of our future resurrection, we can walk in the, in the daylight of personal freedom and we can witness to him and to his glory. So this is a long chapter, 57 verses. I've broken it up into four divisions for you. First of all, we're going to see Jesus delays his departure to visit sick Lazarus. That's the first 16 verses. What we'll learn in these verses is that God's ways are mysterious. We already knew that. But when trials come our way, he has more in mind. That is, God has more in mind for us than just deliverance. His intent is to grow us and to glorify himself. And then we're going to see when Jesus gets to Bethany, he comforts Martha and Mary, verses 17 to 37. And what we're going to see is that Jesus leads the sisters to have a truer and a much greater view of himself. And such a view of God will be comforting. And then Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, verses 38 to 44. Jesus' resurrection power glorified his heavenly Father. And as we trust in his power, we will see our trials as opportunities to also glorify God. 
And then finally, we're going to see that the Jewish leaders respond differently to the resurrection, or to the raising of Lazarus. They will plot to kill Jesus. And it's here that we see God's sovereignty in action because he uses both the obedient and the disobedient. In this case, the disobedient religious leaders to accomplish his purposes. So we've got a lot to go through. Let's jump in to John chapter 11. Now, while this is the first time that John has mentioned this family, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, we get the idea that his original audience uh, already was familiar with them. Because having written long after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John uh, would have expected his readers to be familiar with the other accounts in those Gospels concerning this family. Verse 1 says, Lazarus, Mar Mary, and Martha lived in the village of Bethany. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And it was quite possible that Jesus and his disciples stayed with this family when they came to Jerusalem. Upon receiving the message, Jesus responded in much of the same way that he did back in chapter 9. Jesus said that this sickness would not end in death. But like the beggar's blindness back there in chapter 9, Lazarus's sickness was intended to glorify God. Jesus knew even then that Lazarus was dead or would die, but his death would not be final. His sickness would end ultimately in a resuscitation from death. Lazarus's raising would have the purpose of revealing God's glory to people. And, this gospel, and in this gospel, God's glory is always revealed through the revelation of his son. Twice in these verses, we see that Jesus loved this family. John states in verse 5 that Jesus loved each of them. And the sisters reveal it in their message to him, where they wrote, Lord, the one you love is sick. This family had such a relationship with Jesus that they could say that he loved them. And the Apostle Paul could say the same thing about himself. You'll, you'll remember that he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this is the claim that every one of us who is in Christ can make. You and I are dearly loved by Jesus. And what a way for them to pray. Very simply, Lord, the one you love is sick. And shouldn't we pray that way? Reminding ourselves that in our suffering, Jesus loves us and cares about us. And what is most interesting is that because Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, he delayed going to them for two days. And we wonder how that could be. Well, let's kind of reconstruct the timeline here. And I have a map for you of Judea that uh, you, you will come along with this video. Lazarus was sick in Bethany. Just to, uh, and Jesus he, and his disciples, they were in the Transjordan, probably 20 miles away. It was at least a, a day's journey for a messenger to reach Jesus with the news. But then upon learning of Lazarus' illness, Jesus waited two days. And of course, after that delay, they, would, they then there would be another day for them to return to Bethany. So that, that adds up to four days, which coincides with what we see in verse 17, which states that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Lazarus probably died shortly after the messengers had left for Jesus. And in those days, the deceased was entombed on the same day they died. This all presumes that Jesus knew supernaturally that Lazarus was already dead. And of course, that's implied in the story. His decision to delay was not then a refusal to jump at the sister's request, but a deliberate waiting on his father's time. And when that time was right, Jesus told his disciples, let us go back to, Ju to Judea. And, and of course, their response was a natural one, wasn't it? Kind of in the, in the modern vernacular, they, they replied, Rabbi, are, are you nuts? You see, they did not know the seriousness of Lazarus' condition, but they did know that the Jews were out to get him. And so this, going back to Bethany, well, didn't make sense to them. 
Last week, we talked about Jesus' skill at using illustrations to drive home his teaching points. And he does that here in verses 9 and 10, where Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It is when the person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. In ancient times, when people, when people didn't have the benefits of electricity, work was done primarily during the day. To work in the night, uh, the dark of the night, was uh, difficult, even dangerous. And so it was also common for the ancients to think of the 12 hours of daylight as uh, a metaphor for the length of a man's life. But here, Jesus related the daylight to being in God's will. During our lives, acting in accordance with God's will is always the safest thing to do. To ignore his will, then, is to place ourselves in spiritual danger. And in this case, it was God's will that Jesus returned to Bethany. The disciples did not have God's perspective uh, to understand the situation. So despite the earthly circumstances, Jesus was actually in the safe hands of God. And that's the key point here. There is no safer place to be than in God's will. Jesus then went on and spoke metaphorically. He said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going, to, going there to wake him up. And as, as has been the pattern, Jesus was using symbolism. When he was using symbolism, uh, his, his disciples were thinking literally. In verse 13, he res had to respond plainly to them. Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go. Had Jesus, is, he, uh, had Jesus ha healed the ailing Lazarus, a unique opportunity would have been lost. But to raise a dead Lazarus would reveal the power of God in such a way as to strengthen the faith of his disciples. And to this, Thomas spoke for the group. He said, let us go that we may die with him. Thomas, uh, commonly referred to as doubting Thomas, showed great, great devotion for his Lord here. He may well have been a doubter, but here we see him as an affectionate and loyal doubter. But let me give you the principle here. This first principle is that God's ways and timing are for his glory and our good. In this passage, we get a unique look into the motives and the actions of God. And you, you and I want God to rush in and deliver us immediately from life's dilemmas. To do that would not develop our trust in him, nor would it mold our characters to be like his sons. The struggles in life are what develop and strengthen us. God not only wants to develop us, he desires his glory and he wants us to be holy people. And we won't progress towards holiness if he immediately delivers us from every trial. God's delays aren't necessarily his denials either. Uh, I, I like what Stephen Cole says. He says, we must interpret our suffering by what we know of God's love. We must not interpret his love by our suffering. Because if we do that, we will often come to the wrong conclusions about God and what he is doing. So the question that I want to pose to you is, in what situation is God delaying his deliverance? Do you see that delay as being for your ultimate good? Are you looking with anticipation to how he will bless you even more? Remember, Jesus' delay here was motivated by his love for this family. And he has that same motivation for you and me. Now, when a Jewish person died, their family mourned for an extended period. It, it was considered the duty of friends and, fa and neighbors to comfort the grieving. So when Jesus arrived in Bethany, he found a large number present there to comfort Mary and Martha. Bethany being so close to Jerusalem, they may, many may have come from that city uh, to be with them. Now, if you look at the scenes in the Gospels where Mary and Martha are present, 
you get the idea, uh, you get an idea of their per personalities. Martha was very active. She seemed to be a take charge person, always acting as a hostess, concerned for all uh, of the household duties. Mary, on the other hand, seems to be more introspective, more thoughtful. And so when active Martha learned that Jesus had arrived, she immediately went out to meet him. And what is interesting in their interaction is the way that Jesus drew out her faith and then revealed the truths about himself. In her greeting, Martha expressed confidence in Jesus as a healer. Had he been there, he could have prevented her brother's death. She expressed confidence that God would grant Jesus whatever he asked, even at that moment. Jesus' response, though, was simple. It was designed to draw her out. He said, your brother will rise again. And if you look at this entire conversation, there's no reason to think that Martha had any hopes of any immediate resuscitation of her brother. Her response was an expression of the general theological view of the Jewish people that, that all would rise again on the last day, a reference to G Daniel chapter 12. Now, while Martha loved Jesus very much and, and may well have known m much of his teaching, she still had a limited view of who he is. She thought that Jesus could ask God for miracles and his father would grant them. And she knew intellectually that a great resurrection would occur, but that was far, in her mind, far off in the distant future. Jesus wasn't going to let her stay there with that limited view of himself. And he doesn't do that with us either. That is, if we respond to him in faith. See, in verse 25, he made another of his great I am statements. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus had several times taught about the resurrection in this gospel. And each time he's made it clear that he is the one who raises men. It is with his voice that the dead hear and are raised. And here, when Jesus claims he is the resurrection and the life, he is doing more. He was trying to move Martha and us from believing in this abstract concept to a very personal belief in the one who provides it. Jesus' words are paradoxical. A believer's death brings forth new life. And the reality is that that life of a believer is of such quality that he never dies spiritually. At physical death, our souls go to be with the Lord. And there we will wait for that final resurrection when we will be given glorified bodies. By asking Martha whether she believed this, Jesus was not asking her whether she believed Lazarus would be raised shortly. He was asking her whether she believed in him as the one who provides eternal life. She believed that if Jesus asked God, he would raise the dead. Jesus was saying, no, I have the authority to raise the dead. My father has given it to me. He said that in last week's lesson, chapter 10. He had the authority to lay down his life and he had the authority to take it up. Her confession there in verse 27 then affirms her belief. She said that she believed and that belief was in the one who is the resurrection and the life. And he was the one promised by the scriptures, the Christ. The Christ. And so Martha, what we're seeing here is Martha is starting to connect the dots. She was demonstrating biblical faith. Biblical faith, you'll remember, has three components to it. There is the content, that is belief in something or someone. And that belief must be in Jesus Christ. And her belief, her understanding of him was growing. Uh, biblical faith also requires a heart affection, that deep love for Christ. And that was obvious uh, from their relationship. And then there is obedient action that is required. And we will see that in, in a moment. 
After her great confession, Martha went back to the house to get Mary. And Mary and then those who were comforting her went out to Jesus. And it's here that we get another view of Jesus in his character. That is that he was so touched by Mary's grief that John writes, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The Greek word translated in the NIV as troubled means angered. It's, and it's not a dignified term there in the Greek. It pictures a horse snorting against a burden. Jesus was angry over the effects of sin on people. He was indignant over the impacts of Satan's dominion over men and women. Yes, we are all sinners and we are all responsible for our actions, but Jesus was and is sympathetic to our helpless plight, and he was angered by it. He felt her grief. Verse 35, the shortest verse in the entire Bible, but it says a lot about our Lord. In moments, he would bring joy to Mary and Martha, but still, he took the time to weep with them. That's our calling as well. We are to weep with those who weep, and we are to uh, rejoice with those who rejoice. His example leads us to our next principle, and that is that God's com God comforts us with his character, his promises, and his presence. How different Jesus is compared to us. When we see others grieving, we tend to keep our distance, don't we? We're not sure what to say. Jesus did three things with Martha and Mary. He drew out their faith in him. He moved them from belief in a general concept of the resurrection to a belief in him as God, that he is the resurrection and the life. And then he identified with them in their grieving. He wept with them. And I think this is interesting because he knew that momentarily he was going to bring them great joy. He was going to raise Lazarus, and yet he shared in their pain and in their sadness um, for a time. As Christians, we know that our sadness is not permanent, and yet it is still painful. So the question for us all is, how do you and how do I respond to those who are grieving. Many of us have been through tough times and know the truth of this principle. Therefore, we need to come alongside others who are in sorrow. Like Christ, we cannot let our confidence in God lead to a callousness for those who grieve. We need to identify with them, and what we say to them must point to the truths about our wonderful God and his promises, because he is the uh, only real source of comfort. Now, Jesus then went to Lazarus' tomb, and he commanded the, that the stone be removed. And Martha initially objected. She said, but Lord, by this time there's a bad odor. So here was the great test of faith for Martha. Would she move to trust? And this is a big deal because there was a great deal of shame and defilement that would come from an open tomb, and it would only add to their grief. Jesus encouraged her. He said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so here we see biblical faith expressed in action. She obeyed. The stone was rolled away. And then we see Jesus' prayer, very instructive for us, beginning in verse 41. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus' prayer revealed that he never acts apart from his Father. Jesus' prayer life was primarily about aligning his will with his Father's. How much would our lives change if we spent more time seeking God's will instead of trying to obtain deliverance from him? What is interesting is, this, is that this is a prayer of thanksgiving, and it presumes that he had previously prayed for Lazarus' resuscitation and that this event had been determined before time. 
The goal of, the, of Jesus' prayer was not to reveal himself as a miracle worker, but as the one sent by God himself. Uh, he reveals the unity of the Father and the Son. And then Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he came, although it probably wasn't easy for him. Remember, the Jews prepared the dead by wrapping them in a large linen sheet. And the feet were bound at the ankles and the arms bound to the body with strips uh, of strips of linen. Lazarus probably had to hop or shuffle out of the tomb. It was probably somewhat comical. And, and that's why Jesus commanded the crowd to free him from his grave clothes. Commentators as far back as Augustine have commented that it was important that Jesus called specifically to Lazarus because Jesus' authority is so great that had he not been specific in his call, every tomb in that cemetery would have released its dead. So let me give you the principle here. And that is that God grows our faith in him through trials. Lazarus' resurrection is but a type. Those who hear Jesus' call in the last day will be raised to be with him in glorified bodies. Lazarus was given a new physical life, but one day he would die again. And John's signs, again, uh, are, they, they point to the greater truths that we find, but they're also accompanied by a breakthrough in faith. And we see that in Martha and others. She obviously saw Jesus in a very different light after this event. But it, was all, but it only happened as she responded in obedience to Jesus' challenges to believe in him. Our faith grows as we respond in obedience. Step-by-step -step obedience to him increased her faith and in her understanding of his authority. Obedience leads to blessings, revelation, and new life. And what blessings Martha received as she obeyed. So I want to ask you, where do you need to respond to Christ's promises in obedience? Martha had her mind on her problems. Jesus got her mind off her problems and on to him. We too need to get our minds off our problems and on to God. Because when we do, we will be blessed with new abundant life and a richer understanding of him. Now, when Jesus presented himself to people, there were always two responses. In verse 45, many of those who came to comfort the family put their faith in Jesus. But, uh, and these were the ones who recognized God's glory. So, so in a spiritual sense, they responded to Jesus' call just like Lazarus did. However, in verse 46, some went back to tell the Pharisees what happened. And as a result, the members of the Sanhedrin were called together. And we get a sense of their frustration. Did they see the glory of God? No. No, they acknowledged the miracles. There was no denial there. But unbelieving eyes were, are always blind to God's actions in this world. The religious leaders were motivated out of fear. They were concerned for the loss of their positions, their status. Caiaphas wanted to keep his job, and he wanted to hold the nation together. He wanted to maintain the status quo. But what he should have done was to repent of his sins and confess Jesus as Lord. It's interesting how an unbeliever like Caiaphas could, can express great spiritual insight even when he didn't know what he was talking about. He was correct, but in a completely different way than he thought. He, he said, the death of one man would bring deliverance to the many. But rather than save Israel from Rome, God would save many more with believing hearts. And so the final principle is that God uses all people and circumstances for his purposes. The religious leaders were modeling how and why people refuse Christ. It's not that people don't realize they're sinners. They, they do even though they often don't admit it. And it's not that they don't recognize Jesus as the Son of God. Again, I, I think they do. The religious leaders and people in general refuse to believe because they like things just the way they are. They want to maintain the status quo. Uh, 
They want to live with a sense of control, false as it is. And they prefer, they prefer to live in the darkness. Early in Jesus' ministry, the religious leaders recognized who he was. At least Nicodemus seemed to. But with each refusal of Jesus' revelation, God blinded them more and more. And here we see that he's now really frustrating. Ultimately, they would die in their sins. Continued disobedience leads to frustration. It leads to blindness and death. The religious leaders were concerned that the Romans would come in and destroy their nation, and they would lose their place. They acted in disobedience to God to maintain the status quo, and still, they lost it all. And the sovereign Lord used their disobedience to accomplish his plans. So I want to ask you, final question, do you see God's hand in your circumstances? Are you looking for his good purposes, even though he may be upsetting your world? Disobedience is not the answer. That only leads to frustration, to spiritual blindness, and ultimately to death. God will accomplish his purposes, and he will do so using both the obedient and the disobedient. You see, Jesus' resurrection power will prevail in this world, but it will produce a new life of freedom from sin and death. And will that be true for you and for me? That's the question. Will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Father in heaven, um, your, son, your son came into the world to disrupt the status quo. And we pray, Lord, that... Um, that uh, our ministry would do the same thing because the status quo is uh, is a, a reality of sin and death it's people living in darkness and we pray lord that as we uh, appropriate the truths that we find here in this passage and that we too um, take the opportunities to share the gospel with other people we pray lord that um, that you would move in their hearts and minds that they too would respond in belief, and that they would rest in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.